There we go. I'd like to thank everybody tonight for coming to our tonight's city council meeting. The council chamber is open to the public at 100% capacity. Today is Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022. Uh, I don't see Pastor Jeff's not in, so we'll have a... Um, I'll do the prayer tonight, and then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance following. Everybody, please stand. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. We thank you for the rain that you gave us yesterday and today, and we ask, Lord, that you continue to give us a lot of rain this uh, fall and winter, Lord. Lord, we thank you for everything you've given us each day. We ask that you bless our citizens, keep all of our citizens here in Kingsburg safe and healthy, Lord. Lord, we pray for our first responders. Give them wisdom and give them strength every day, Lord, to do what they need to do. We ask, Lord, that you come be with us tonight. Give our council wisdom today and every day so that we can be good leaders for our community. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge my allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'd like to call this meeting to order. Madam Clerk, can you please take roll call? Member Hurtado? Here. Council Member Cristel Bruno? Here. Chairperson Palomar? Here. Next, we need to approve the agenda. Action by the council to approve the agenda or to make modifications. Items that can be added to the agenda is constrained by state law. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll make that motion with the slight modification to remove the FCRTA uh, presentation uh, to be moved to another agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. How many opposed? I don't know. Four. There we go. Next on our agenda, we have presentations. Tonight, we have Fall of 2022 Public Service Award, Firefighter Medic Devin Young. Uh, Devin Young, can you please come forward? Yeah, thank you. That's good right there. Thank you. I have something I'm going to read about Devin tonight. Devin, congratulations on your nomination and award for the Employee Recognition Program with the City of Kingsburg. Kingsburg is a wonderful community that is maintained through the hard work of our citizens, volunteers, and employees. We sincerely thank you for the hard work in keeping our community a safe place to live, work, and play. Having dedicated individuals such as yourself gives Kingsburg an invaluable asset, especially when it involves the quality life of our residents and visitors. You were nominated for this astuteness and forethought to put together a program and kits for, for multi-casual incidents after observing a recent call where the Kingsburg Fire Department assisted and the responding agency did not have one in place. Your ability not to only see a problem, but to also take the initiative and time to construct a program, put together kits, and train employees is exemplary. We know you provide excellent service daily with the fire department, and your commitment and dedication to the health and safety of our citizens shows the character you bring to the city of Kingsburg every day. Thank you and congratulations. So one of the things that I'd like to present Devin with is the Chief's Compensation Point. He's only given out on special occasions, especially to uh, meritorious services or things just like you've seen today. Uh, Devin did go way above and beyond. And by the way, Devin was still
Okay, next on our agenda, public comment. This is time for any citizen to come forward and address the city council with any issue within its jurisdiction that is not listed on the agenda. A maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker. Do we have anybody here tonight that would like to public comment? Okay, come on up. live up in the northeastern corner of Kingsburg, and I just wanted you to make be aware. I think we need some traffic control up there. Madsen is a drag strip. People driving up and down Madsen, 60 miles an hour. We have a beautiful walkway. Congratulations to the city for putting that up there. And there happens to be small children on their bikes and people talking on phones and driving 60 miles an hour. If we get some traffic control up there, I think it would be in the best interest of the public to do that. And I'll appreciate that. Real quick, Coach, are you talking about between Stroud and Yeah, kind of, it's mostly Stroud north of Stroud, Cameron. but even okay. even south of Stroud, you know, that thing's get going pretty good through there. Yeah, yeah they do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 Anybody else here for public comment tonight? No? Okay, then I'll close public comment. Next on the agenda, we have consent calendar. Items considered routine in nature are to be placed on the consent calendar. They will be considered as one item and voted upon in one vote unless individual consideration is requested. Each vote in favor of the consent calendar is considered and recorded as a separate affirmative vote in favor of each action listed. Approval of the consent calendar items include recital readings, ordinances, by titles only, and adoption of recommended actions contained in staff reports. Does anybody want to pull an item? No. Anybody in the public want to pull an item? Tonight we have um, item 5.1. 5.2, 5 5.3, 5 and 5.4. Anybody pull item? Okay, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. Motion carries. Next, we have regular calendar. Tonight, we have item 6.1 adoption of 2022 California Building Code Title 24. Staff report, staff report by A.J. O'Connell, building official. I'm a little tall. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm A.J. O'Connell. I'm the building official for the city of Kingsburg. It's a pleasure and it's a privilege to address you for the first time tonight. The item before you tonight is consideration of adoption of the 2022 California Building Standards Codes, parts one through 12, the amended 2021 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, and the amended 2021 International Property Maintenance Code through ordinance. Adoption of formal building codes and property maintenance codes is an action that has not been taken by the city of Kingsburg in over a decade. This is a measure that will modernize our code enforcement efforts modernize our process for permitting and create a safer community for all. Title 24 refers to the chapter of the California Code, California Code of Regulations, California Building Standards Code. 
As indicated in your staff report, the cycle for developing the 2022 Title 24 California Codes involved a nearly five-year effort that included both national and state organizations, many votes and affirmations, and is slated to become enforceable state law on January 1, 2023. Staff will be required to enforce the 2022 California Codes at that time. While the 2022 California Codes will become state law on January 1, regardless, the city of Kingsburg, as a charter city, is legally permitted to adopt the codes through ordinance into our municipal code as enforceable at the local level. Generally speaking, building codes are minimum prescriptive and performance standards for the design, construction, alteration, maintenance, and use of buildings. Building codes exist to ensure safety of structures for building occupants and the public at large. Cities across the state and the country adopt building codes to make their community safer and more resilient. The importance of building codes cannot be understated. In 2010, following a devastating 7.0 earthquake, nearly 300,000 fatalities occurred in the country of Haiti. A few months later, a similar sized earthquake struck the country of Chile, but with only 500 fatalities. Multiple studies in the aftermath of these two natural disasters showed that the prevalence of buildings constructed to modern building codes in Chile was a significant factor in that country's drastically lower fatality rate. In your packet is a more in-depth discussion of these findings presented by FEMA. The adoption of the California codes began with the formulation of the model codes by the International Code Council. Interests from across the country submit code proposals for review, discussion, debate, and eventual approval. These code changes are then voted on by the public and governmental bodies across the country, including the city of Kingsburg. Shortly before the publishing of those model codes, the development begins anew for the related California codes. This process repeats itself every three years. The California codes are generally more restrictive, owing to the state's unique geological, topographical, environmental, and climatic conditions. This is best reflected in the state's more stringent energy codes and provisions for development in the wildland urban interface. The 2022 California codes are based on the 2021 model codes. Your staff report details some of the notable changes to the California codes from the previous editions to the current. While adoption of the codes does give the city the ability to amend the codes, staff is proposing no substantive amendments to the California Title 24 codes. Staff is, however, proposing to adopt nearly 30 appendices spread out between the California codes. These supplemental standards are not necessarily amendments per se, but rather minimum criteria for types of construction and uses that are deemed unique. These include standards for patio covers, 3D and replicable buildings, emergency housing, haunted houses, and fire apparatus roads. These appendices will give the city added tools for code enforcement. In addition to the recommended approval of the California codes, staff is proposing endorsement of the 2021 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code and the 2021 International Property Maintenance Code. These two standards are not specifically enacted as part of Title 24, but are frequently referenced within those statutes. Since they are both developed as part of the model code process, their adoption will allow for greater continuity amongst the code family, thus providing better clarity in our code enforcement efforts. Staff is proposing an amended pool and spa code. The amendments are intended to better align the model code with the provisions within existing state law, better continuity with the energy code, and establishing minimum prescriptive standards for residential spa construction. Staff is proposing an amended property maintenance code. The amendments better align with current departmental policies and practices, provides year-round compliance for heating and insect screening, and expands prohibited occupancies. The final staff proposal is a reorganization of the current municipal code sections on residential solar energy permitting from the current health and safety chapter to the existing building construction chapter 15. This change will not result in any disruption or adjustment in current city policies or practices. This is a housekeeping measure intended to clarify the sections of municipal code that are most relevant. I want to thank you for your attentiveness. Staff encourages adoption of the ordinance and I'm available to answer any questions. Council. 
It will be implemented as of January 1, 2023. Exactly the state law. Yes, that's correct. Question I have is, what if we vote not to approve it? So what does that do? That's a, that's a good question. Since Title 24 is codified in the California Code of Regulations, it becomes state law regardless of any sort of action from the city on January 1, 2023. It becomes law. It becomes law. By, by adopting it as a city, it gives us the ability with which to amend it. Um, it gives us the ability to add appendices. It gives us the ability to also incorporate the International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, uh, the International Property Maintenance Code. Um, and it essentially puts us in a little bit more of a control when it comes to developing building standards within the city. Um, keep, you know, keep in mind amendments can only restrict the code. They can't relax the code, unfortunately, but it would be one of those where if you were to give us direction, we could, um, you know, we could develop amendments as such. Public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody want to comment on this agenda item? No. Okay. Do we have any more questions, Council Member? You want the mic there? Or? Okay. So. The recommended action is staff recommends that we adopt the title 24 code. I'll make that motion. It's a, it's a motion to waive the, the reading of the ordinance and pass to a second reading. Okay. Motion would be to waive the first reading of the ordinance, introduced ordinance number 2022-022, an ordinance of the City of Kingsler, an ordinance of the City of Kingsler amending various chapters and sections within said chapters of Title 15 of the Kingsler Municipal Code and adopting the California Code of Regulations, Title 24, 2022, addition parts 1, Two, five, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, and twenty twenty one. International Property Management Code as amended, and the twenty twenty one International Swimming Pool and Spa Code as amended. Amending City of Kingsland Ordinances twenty two thousand nine zero one section one and repealing ordinance twenty twenty zero zero two. Ordinance 2010-04, Ordinance 467, Ordinance 9906, Section 4, and Ordinance 2015-09 of the City of Kingsburg, and passes the second reading on November 16, 2022, with the following re recital consist constituting reading and title of the ordinance. <laughs> that was a lot. I will second that. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Man, I need my reading glasses. I brought my reading glasses. <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah. Okay, motion is approved. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, 6.2 Mid Valley Disposal SB 1380 update. Presentation by Thomas Ann, and that's me. Uh, good evening, Council, Mayor, staff, residents. Thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, you guys just signed your franchise agreement, so we're going to go over a little bit of the 1383 implementation, what we've been doing, and what we're going to continue to do. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So some of the stuff we currently do for you guys are community events. You guys have probably seen this at the Swedish Festival and the Crawfish Festival. This gives us a great opportunity to give educational outreach to the public, let them know what items go on what stream, 
Uh, we play a game where we spin a wheel. It has different items. It kind of just just gets the participation factor with the residents in play. So we do that. We give out swag. Uh, we participate in the parade. Obviously, that's not a SB 1383 requirement, but we love the city and <laughs> and we love to be a part of the community and be out there and show the community that we're here and and we're a part of you guys. And so um, community events is something that we currently do and we're going to continue to do. I think we did about four this year. These two we did in the last four months. So that's something that we're doing and continue to do. Um, cleanup events. We currently do these and we're going to continue to do these. Um, we held one about a week and a half to two weeks ago, I believe. Great success. Um, it's held twice a year, once in the spring, once in the fall. Um, it encourages the public participation just like the community outreach does. It also gives us a chance to educate the generator or the resident about what goes where when they bring it out there. They have a lot of metal, a lot of appliance, a lot of e-waste. So we do a little bit of education while also helping them get rid of bulk items that they wouldn't normally be able to get rid of at their household carts. Um, and yeah, and it ensures the, that any unacceptable items stay out of their streams. So you guys are staying super compliant with cow recycling and, and all the other things moving forward. Not with just 1383, but also AB 341, which is your recycling, and 1826, which is your green waste one as well. Uh, we have passed out educational material. Um, I gave the clerk uh, some packets of the educational material that we hand out. She can give them to you when you guys uh, want to check them out. But we do a 1383 informational flyer that we've already mailed out to all the public, kind of telling you what to expect, what the changes are going to be moving forward. A recycle guide, it's just a diagram showing what items go in what streams, just to help the generators understand what they need to do. The organics pill guide is something special that we do. We give away organic pills at the events. Um, it's a pill that you would put on your countertop, and if you had food waste, you'd scrape it in your organic pail, and then you would take your pill out to your green waste. So it's a way that Mid Valley is kind of just trying to engage the public into thinking about how to do more with their green waste, especially inside of their home. Um, and an instructional service guide. We are going to roll that out. Um, I got the mailers to the city last week, so every resident will get an instructional service guide that will tell you exactly what we're doing, what we're going to do, and how to stay compliant. And like I said, she has those copies if you guys like to see them. Oh, and you know what, real fast. The two, the two employees that you see here, the one on the right, that's Juana Vasquez. She's your local coordinator. You will see her a lot around the city. She's our boots on the ground. She does contamination monitoring, continued education with businesses, and she's really a great, great asset for us, and she does a really good job with your city. Um, the employee on the left, that's Maria Ayella. That is our food recovery specialist. I will touch base more about food recovery later on in, in the slideshow, but um, she does a fantastic job identifying Tier 1 and Tier 2 generators, making sure record keeping is in order, making sure contracts are in place, and everything that has to do with food recovery. She really handles that whole and spearheads that. Um, so we continue to do this, and we, uh, we do this now, and we'll continue to do it moving forward. And this is residential and commercial contamination auditing and monitoring. So what we do is um, Juana will come out and do 30 businesses every three weeks or so in, in Kingsburg. She assesses the, each can, whether it be trash, recycle, or organics. Um, if she finds something that's not supposed to be in the stream, she makes a contamination tag, and it, she circles what items are in there that aren't supposed to be. In a business, for example, she will go into the business, talk to the manager at hand, kind of give them the continued education, let them know, hey, there's some stuff in your stream that doesn't need to be there. She will also get ownership or property management information, so then we can also send mail out education to the owners and or the property managers. So we kind of hit them all from all angles as, as best we can to get the education and the compliance right then and there. Um, when it comes to residential contamination, we do auditing as well. Uh, we, we pick random spots or we talk to our route supervisors, our operations guys and ask, hey, where's the problem areas in the city? Where can we go and really make a difference, make, make a dent on, 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 on uh, cross contamination? And when we do that, we tag the can with the smaller uh, tag that you see there. So the resident will see that a contamination tag on their can. We will also mail out educational information to them. So that's kind of how we, we, we balance the businesses and the residents to stay compliant with 1383. Um, so this is where 1383 kind of gets a, to be a lot. Um, tier one generators and tier two generators 
Tier 1 generators, just so you know, are wholesale food vendors, food service providers, grocery stores greater than or equal to 10,000 square feet, or food distributors. Um, we were ahead of the eight ball in the city of Kingsburg. We really did a lot of this legwork way before the franchise agreement was in place. So we've already identified all Tier 1 generators. All Tier 1 generators have already received educational material. And they're working with Maria Ayala to find a food organization to get a contract in place or find out what they're going to do with their food waste. So um, a part of that is we go back there. We make sure that they're implementing the organics program within their business. WANA then goes and reassesses the business uh, every so often to make sure they're staying compliant. And um, like I said, Maria Ayala ensures that the contract is in place with the food organization. All requirements by CalRecycle. Um, you then get to your tier two generators, a little bit bigger of businesses, a little bit harder to kind of manage, but we have until 2024 to get those in line. But we're already ahead of the eight ball on that as well. We've identified tier two generators. We're currently working on giving education material out to them. I think we're about 70% done in the city of Kingsburg right now. Um, we will review the businesses to ensure their compliance, just like we do with tier ones. Tier one and tier two is not much different. It's just the size of it. So you can see tier twos are hotels, 200 plus rooms, restaurant facilities equal or greater than 5,000 square feet, health facilities with 100 plus beds, stadiums, local education agencies, that'd be high school, elementary schools that serve hot food, and then your state agency cafeteria is obviously uh, greater than or equal to 5,000 square feet or 250 plus seats. So that's how they meet the criteria to be a tier two generator, tier one generator. Tier one and tier two generators do not get waivers, so they have to actually buy in. They have to do what is asked by CalRecycle. So we are, we've done all those things, review the business to ensure compliance, and we are currently working on getting contracts or introducing food recovery organizations to the tier two generators to get waivers in place. Um, we have until January 1st, 2024 for tier two, so we have a little bit of time, but like I said, we like to be ahead of, of the curve a little bit, so we're, we're being proactive in our approach when it comes to the generators. So something that is new that you will see in the city is a commercial organic bin. Um, right now, you don't see a lot of green waste bins. You probably don't see any. I think we have two uh, currently at schools. And the rest of the, uh, the generators using 96-gallon carts. Some businesses use three to four 96-gallon carts, and they qualify for an organic bin. So you will see organic bins start to be coming through the city here and there. I think we have 19 bins and 10 to 12 uh, businesses already um, ready to roll out. So we're just kind of finalizing those things, making sure the businesses are ready, making sure there's space. I work with Daniel uh, hand in hand to make sure that we're following the enclosure ordinance, making sure there's space for these things. And so um, we've been doing a really good job working with Daniel, trying to make sure that these businesses can get what they need when it comes to an organic bin. Um, besides the organic bin, it, it, you know, we will go out there and ensure, again, that it's being utilized correctly. Um, and, and, and the whole hopes of 1383 is that when you start to put a lot of your food waste in your, in, your, in your green organics, it will then minimize the need for your trash service. So our idea is let's, let's push the green waste, get them to start converting over and getting their streams in order, and then actually save them money in the long run by reducing their trash service. So, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. Yeah, it will, it will. Because um, honestly, the trash, because we could, well, just trash is the most expensive one because it has to go to the landfill and there's fees associated with that. So that service is a bit more expensive than recycles and organics. Um, then all organic material will be converted into compost and mulch for city purchase to help meet procurement requirements. If you guys don't know, we have a composting facility out in Kerman. All the green waste goes out there. It's a gore facility. I won't get in the weeds with it, but about 60 to 80 days after uh, the load is dropped, it's turned into compost. We keep compost there year round and I'll get to my next slide. Um, we call it Kerman's Best Compost because it's out in Kerman. But um, the compost is available year-round for jurisdictions. In fact, um, Daniel uh, and the city purchased 40 tons for the cleanup event and gave it away to the public. It was a great success. That's one way to meet your procurement requirements. Your, your requirements are based off your population. So every, every five years, they reassess your population, and then they come up with a amount of tons of organic material they want you to procure. Compost falls under that, and the kind of compost that we make is CDFA regulated, so it's even better compost than you would get in other places. So what we give you is 100% uh, compliant, and we give it away at cleanup events. We, we encourage the jurisdictions to look at maybe drought-resistant landscaping where you can sheet mulch the existing turf, 
with some compost and then and put some low drought stuff in, um, or even top dressing your turf, your city parks. Um, if you can throw compost on there at, at a couple inches or an inch or so, it'll, it'll really help with soil reten or water retention, um, nitrogen delivery, uh, fertilizer delivery, save you money on you know, maybe fertilizers and other things that you guys may do. And it hits your procurement target. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. You're, 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 you're doing well with your parks and recs, and you're obviously hitting your procurement target. So um, that's really it. I was just in a nutshell, just wanted to give you a snapshot of what we're doing in the city moving forward. Um, 1383 is a big bill. We've talked about it plenty of times at council. So if you have any questions moving forward, um, I can leave my contact information. Feel free to get a hold of me. Um, I thank you guys for your time, and I just want to reiterate that we are really proud to serve the city of Kingsburg. We've served for a while here now, and, and we, we look to serve as long as we can and, and on to the near future, and we really appreciate the partnership that you guys have given us. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any public comment on SD 1383? Council discussion? Do you have a couple of questions? Uh, you talked about the warning tag being put up last night and not spread. I, I'm just curious, obviously this comes with heavy fine potentially if you become out of compliance with the city. So I'm curious, in your audits, how, how many violations are you finding? What's your general percentages on your residential audits? Probably, it obviously depends on the area, right? But. We actually did an audit uh, last week in Kingsburg, and I think that we had about 35 to 40% contamination in our recyclable. Not much in the green waste. Obviously, palms are one of the things that people tend to put in there that's a contamination risk, but in the recyclable side, we've had a little bit, uh, I would say 25 to 40%, just depends uh, in the area. But um, the residents are really responsive. Right, you, you guys have great residents here who are very compliant that want to do the right thing. So every time we meet with a resident or they come out while we're doing the tag, they're more than happy to, to, to switch what they're doing and understand. And, and it's hard, right? Like who knows that pizza boxes go in the green waste if it's got pizza grease on it? Not a lot of people do. Yeah, right. So that's the thing that, that we're trying to educate. And that's really what we're trying to do until 2024. You speak about enforcement, and enforcement comes into play in 2024. So for this last 2022 and 2023, we're really just going as hard as we can on educating all businesses, all residents on how to stay compliant. Regarding the organic bin? Yeah. You have, you have two currently about you know, holding out your Yeah, two at schools right now, yeah. So are they just throwing the raw food directly into that can? Or is, are they allowed to put that into a bag and then put it in a can? Or what is that? I will explain to you that. Um, we don't allow any compostable bags in our green waste. They don't, with the gore system that we have, they don't, they don't break down as well as we, we would hope. Um, raw food is not allowed in your green waste. It has to be cooked food. So um, to answer that, they are allowed to put food, but it's got to be cooked food, not raw food. So I'm assuming if they put in like or any, any type of bag, so like put in, there's no bags, there's no anything. My, and my concern is how often do they even put that in? Um, I believe your contract stipulates once a week. It's a one and a half, it's a one and a half yard bin. I think that's in the contract, and, and it's it's being picked up once a week, or or it will be picked up once a week. And you have people who don't register in those receipts. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, we we, we have a, an instructional guide on how to keep those clean. Spray them out with vinegar once a week. Do these other things. But you're right. Um, it, it 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 can be it can be problematic over time. But um, we have some things that we give out to the businesses to help kind of combat that. And then the last question, just specifically regarding the compost, we're required to purchase a certain amount of compost, correct? You're, we're required to purchase a certain amount of organic material. You can, you can produce renewable gas, you can produce mulch, you can produce compost, but it's tough to get renewable gas that's made from organics right now, especially locally. So really the, the, the big option you have is, is compost. city required to purchase and disperse a certain amount of that yes yeah based on your population you are required to purchase a certain amount of tonnage now the state just passed ab 1985 which i didn't get into but 1985 actually postponed the procurement purchase requirement for all of 2022 you only have to do 30 percent of the requirement in 23 
65% in 24 and 100% by 25. So the state heard the problems that the, the jurisdictions were having by procuring, I can't think about the top of my head, but you guys were somewhere in between 600 to 800 tons. How much of a ton? We do 20 ton loads at 600, so I think it's, you, you break it down. It's, it's, um, I don't have my calculator. I'm not good at simple math, to be honest with you, but um, it's $600 for 20 tons a load. Yeah, I have a question. Do you have like farmers or anybody uh, wanting to buy the compost? So yeah, obviously we have a ton of customers for the compost, but at Mid Valley, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that all jurisdictions that required procurement had that in-house from us. So we are currently not selling any to any farmers. Now, now the 1985 had passed, and now. The 100% procurement's off the table completely. Now it's no procurement whatsoever. Are we sitting on a decent amount of compost? Yes. And will we look to farmers to do that? We probably will. Um, but right now, I don't think there's any movement on that. But you might hear a commercial or two coming up looking for customers for, for compost, at least for this year, and in the hopes that next year, I mean, we will have enough. I think right now, we have well over the amount that we need. I think we're only running half of the facility right now, and we just purchased 20 acres behind it to expand it if we need to, because the population is going to continue to rise, and the, and 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 your procurement requirements going to continue to rise as well. So, we're forward thinking when it comes to that, and we want to make sure that we are giving the cities, all of our cities and jurisdictions, exactly what they need when they need it. Thank you. Information only. Last one, maybe. Next, we have 6.3 2022 Fire Department update. Presentation by Fire Chief Daniel Perkins. Good evening, members of the council and the members of the public. Thank you very much for attending. All right, so this is to update us on the what's been going on in the fire department over the last year. Quite a bit, quite a bit. I'll try to keep it brief, I promise. Uh, once again, what I do want to reiterate is that we have established some, some true mission, vision, values that we're trying to educate not only the public but also our own people about. So that's why you see this consistently. You come to the fire stations, one of the first things you see on the walls same thing everywhere. We, we've got to get on the same page with what we're about. And that's what really we'll talk about a little bit in this. So what are we about? Um, serving the public. Bottom line, serving the public. So what overview, what we're going to talk about. Very quickly, statistics, finance, staffing, capital improvements, equipment, training, and then our programs. So we'll get through these as quickly and painlessly as possible. So it's statistics. I think they're very important for you to understand how well the fire department is actually doing. And these are indicators of response times and response totalities of emergency calls. There's emergency calls and then requests for service. We are not going to drill into that tonight. We will in future, though, endeavor to, to explain that differentiation, which is really important. What we go to as a 911 call can be very different than, can you come help me with these other issues that we're having, inspections and other programs and processes. So year to date, we're going to compare 2021 from July 1st of 2022 to July 1st of 2021. We ran about 2,815 calls. Those are emergency calls, 911 calls. 79% uh, medical, 21% fire. Year to date for 2022, uh, that number increased pretty significantly. Uh, 2,919 calls. Not tremendously. Uh, but significantly enough, it's a 4% increase year to year in the same time frames. But we're not measuring the last part of this year where we've seen a steady increase over every month, again, at that same rate, about 4%. So we're seeing that consistent year to year increase of demand for emergency calls. I think the, what we'll elucidate in further discussions with council and at your direction to give you that information about the differentiation between calls for service and emergency calls, because they're all, they're all very important as to far as what's the fire department actually spending their time doing. Not playing checkers, I can definitely tell you that. So 
Uh, the National Fire Protection Agency recommendations for response times are in this NFPA recommendation. NFPA is the standard document that all fire departments typically go to. It's how we measure what we do. Uh, essentially, for fire departments, the general accepted response time is four minutes within a mile and a half radius of each of the fire stations that you're around and eight minutes for an emergency medical service call. So the big differentiation, they typically want you to get four members on scene to stop that clock. So how do we measure up to those particular statistics? Right now, our EMS response times, uh, when we measured them in 2021, we were at 7.07, seven minutes, seven seconds. So remember that was eight minutes for a national average. We wanted to be about eight minutes. So how are we performing a year later after we've gotten additional people? And again, this is just within the city limits, just within the city limits, mile and a half away from the nearest fire station. EMS response time for 2022, five minutes, 44 seconds. That's a minute and 23 seconds quicker. This is a significant decrease. Now, why the decrease? We have more people, more staffing, more units available to answer those calls. And as you saw tonight, we have really great people. We have very good people doing a really good job. And that's really a testament to this is just what the stats say. What is the data telling us about what we're doing? Fire response times, pretty much a similar issue. Uh, they were at four minutes uh, as an accepted standard across the nation. We were at three minutes and 50 seconds, so we were under the national average. Uh, that was a year ago. <clears throat> and again, all within the city limits only, K zones. Fire response times now for this last year, three minutes and 48 seconds. So we're getting better. Even our fire response times are getting better. So again, measuring the same thing. It's a lot about measurement and data retrieval. Finance. This is gets a little bit of, uh, I wouldn't say into the weeds, but just generalizations. So ambulance revenue has, has increased essentially by 26% with a very conservative estimate. And I say estimates because much of what we experience with ambulance financing is uh, a moving target. So we really have to look at data sets that are, that are comparing similar years and similar blocks of time. So I know that it sounds kind of, uh, I don't mean to be vague with it, but we try to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So that helps with it. So in the process, um, a lot of this was due to us increasing the ambulance rates that we had from last year. And it about averages or shows what we increased the rates by. So we're seeing that on the back end now, about a year later, we're seeing that increase. And again, this is a very conservative estimate. Um, and again, some of this is also associated with changes in payer mixes. And remember a payer mix is that uh, differentiation between the groups of folks who have different types of insurances. And we kind of talked about that when we asked for the ambulance rate increase last year. So I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but there's a small graph that's on the presentation tonight we'll show you. This is actually the piece that comes up from Sharp Ambulance Billing. So these aren't just Dan Perkins Fire Chiefs formulations. This is stuff right from their website that I'm showing you. And this is what it basically boils down to is that percentage of change. The one anomaly you, sh you, you see up here is in January of 2021 versus January of 2022. We went back and did a little more research and it was very similar every other year. So we don't know why that's there. So we're looking into why that's there. But with that statistical piece and that anomaly, that's why we say it's a 26% known increase in revenue. If we were to throw that out, it would be about a 34% increase in revenue. So we really wanna make any kind of uh, calculations about how well the ambulance would be doing or how well the fire department would be doing in a conservative fashion. That's why we stuck with 26% rather than 34%. Uh, again, this is less than one year's worth of data, uh, sharp billing only. And this intergovernmental transfer is not included in these amounts of money. Remember the intergovernmental transfer is basically the gap money that we get paid for the calls that we bill and Medi-Cal, Medicare, Medicaid pays that gap. So that IGT is not part of this calculation and the money you see here. That's a whole different super complicated formula that's well beyond the, the course of tonight. All right, here's the ambulance payer group. This is still staying on track, just what we did. This was uh, done in the same timeframes, July 1st of 2021 to July 1st of 2022. 
this is still our breakdown of who's actually paying us, where, where the insurance has come from. So we're not seeing these huge swings as other communities have seen. Uh, the bigger concern was that there was going to be a big drop off of folks from private insurances because of loss of jobs due to the pandemic. We didn't see that. We saw about a 1% change in our Medi-Cal uh, group, and that was it. And that was over that five or sorry, four year average from all of our statistics that we could gather from that. Again, a slightly higher percentage of Medi-Cal. Training revenue. So training revenue has been very, very uh, important to us. And by training revenue is essentially what we do, uh, rather than playing checkers, we're out actually learning how to do a better job. And we'll talk about learning how to do a better job and how it's actually having a huge impact positively, not only on the citizens and what we offer the citizens as far as a public service, but in the pocketbook. And we'll show you why that's so. So what have we de been doing? So. Because we've been in training more, we're able to put more of those hours into our inner, it's called an ISA agreement, it's basically between the community colleges and us. We get a certain number of dollars for every person that sits in any period of time in a training class or attends training. So we've increased that by 14% over this last year. So that equates to direct dollars in the fire department's budget to offset whatever we're doing and basically go back and train even more. So we're getting more of those classes and we're training our own folks to be instructors, uh, creating, a, creating our internal instructors, increases the job efficiency, and increases the ability of our staff to provide a really good product, to be more effective and efficient. So how does that also parlay out to the public? Well, we also have additional staffing that we've been able to procure over this last year. So that was due to the 50, 50 split of the hospital district. They supplied 50% of six bodies, and we supplied the other 50%. That has led to a 33% increase from four people on a day to six people on a day, which you saw in turn also allowed us to do a number of different things. So we'll see how that actually has now impacted us a year later. So allowed the second ambulance to be staffed 24-7, so more people on duty, more ability to grab calls. We're not giving those calls away to other agencies that run a very similar uh, type of setup in their fire departments because they also can reap the benefits of having billing or billing for transport ambulance services. Uh, increased firefighting forces, and this will become really key in the next few slides. Because we were able to increase those firefighting forces, because we didn't hire just single role emergency medical services for personnel, it increased our firefighting staffing. And we'll see how that really parlays into the bigger picture and impact upon the public. Uh, it also allowed our community risk reduction to take place. And again, we'll show you why. It's all leading up to something very critical here. Uh, it helped us with our admin staffing. We've got two part-time folks that really helped us drill into the analysis and reporting. Allowed geographic information systems to actually start being part of what we do to give you this data, to really start drilling into it and finding out where are we missing the mark? What can we do and be more efficient and effective at? and also decreased our workload through grants and uh, accounts payable management. We become a lot more effective and efficient there. So all of this led to this, this insurance service offices change. So every five years, the Insurance Services Office of America, along with a group called Vera Risk, they're related, they're kind of the same, same company, but not. I don't know how that works out, but don't ask me. Uh, maybe I might, that might be a good question for you. How does that work out? Two companies with dissimilar names doing the same job. But essentially, ISO, they come out and they rate the fire department. They rate it on a number of different scales. And they rate it basically on your ability to fight a fire with the number of people to get bodies to stop the fire and what we do to prevent a fire from occurring. So they rate it on water systems. They rate it on our, our equipment that we have, our total personnel that are staffing. Also, our auto aid and mutual aid agreements, as well as our communication systems. The water system is a big portion of that. So it's about 50% of that. So without our strong water system and our great public works that we've already established, we would not have been able to have this ISO change. So when I say ISO change, the Kingsburg Fire Department was at a three. And we'll kind of talk about what a three meant. And here's the people here, ISO and Vera Risk. The best, in other words, on a scale of one to 10, one is the best, 
three is, uh, it's not too bad, but it's not nearly a two or a one. So right now, we just changed from a three to a two. That is going to have huge implications for the public at large, and we'll talk about that specifically. This is how we were able to do that specifically. We started doing a lot more pre-planning over the last 18 months. We got some consultants that helped us figure out how do we better uh, plan for emergencies? How do we put that on paper so it can be transferred to other people that are emergency responders so we can do a better job when the fire does actually occur? Equipment, staffing, and water system were all part of that big equation. Essentially, what it did, we moved from a three to a two. Uh, it will basically allow some savings to occur in the pocketbook of the everyday ordinary citizen within Kingsburg. It lowers your insurance rates and it creates a lowered risk for anyone that's getting any type of homeowner's insurance or business insurance. Um, I've had some discussions with them. They try to be as nebulous as possible, they being the ISO folks. They say between a three and a 7% decrease with you moving up every other um, tier from one to the next. So you can see in this graph right here, countrywide, these are all of the fire departments that participate in this <coughs> scheduling. So it's about 40,000 fire departments in the United States. We were at class three. So there's 4,000 departments at a class three throughout the United States. We moved from that to the next tier. That puts us in the top 4% of agencies in the United States. So we're moving up little bit by little bit with your all, with the support of the community and with the support of the council. I think that's really important for us to realize that without that, it wouldn't have been possible. So the, the community applauds you and your decisions. Safety with our capital improvement. A couple other things we've been doing. At Station 2, uh, we went to great lengths to make sure we're taking care of our people. So we purchased a commercial ice maker. Uh, it sounds like, why does the fire department need a commercial ice maker? Well, fire departments and fire have a lot of heat, and we have a lot of people that get really hot. The only way to get that heat away from them is to make sure and ensure that they have adequate drinking water that's cooled or chilled, and that's also a part of OSHA regulation. So we're really being a lot more compliant and thinking about the people that we're having do this work for us, so the people on the ground doing the actual work. The other portions of safety at Station 2, we got a brand new air fill station. Now, what does that mean? That means we're able to actually fill our own air bottles. Before, we had an agreement with the city of Selma that we would have them fill our air bottles, and I'll be super honest with you. I went by and looked at that. No, we're, that was why we did this. Uh, this was an initiative that went about three years in the making, and this took a lot of, of effort. This is about a $70,000 machine, and it essentially has a compressor in it that uh, filters the air and pushes it into the firefighters' air packs and make sure that the firefighter has clean breathing air and is certified every year to do that. So now we have our own. We don't rely on another agency to maintain it. Um, although I trust other people in our own industry to do that, uh, when you would trust but don't verify, that could be a problem. So we're definitely trusting but verifying. And now we can trust our own people. We've also trained someone to specifically run that machine. Other things for safety, uh, this is a PPE extractor, so personal protective equipment extractor. Essentially a super expensive washing machine that pulls all of the contaminants out of the firefighter's gear. And up until two years ago, uh, cancer was the leading cause of firefighter death. Uh, now it's suicide. But with this extractor, we're able to pull all of those contaminants out of the firefighter's gear and actually put it into a dryer, which we also purchased, and is at station one. So now we have match sets of types of equipment at both Station 2 and Station 1, which does a number of things, improves our turnaround times and decreases those exposures to carcinogens. So overall, we're a lot more effective and efficient, and we're using those pieces of our capital improvement items to make sure that we're putting all the safeguards in place to take care of our employees, our number one resource. Other pieces of safety. Uh, station one, uh, we took some of our monies for capital improvements and redid all of the floors. If you had come into fire station one last year about this time and you were walking across it, it was an ice skating rink. The minute it got wet, it was dangerous. So we went about finding a contractor that did these commercial floors for fire station. They came in and did the floor. And you see this really great, nice, light, white color or gray colored epoxy. 
and we had them put the fire department emblem in the middle of the floor. Also, the other side of it uh, has one of the slogans that the, uh, our folks wanted to have put in there. And essentially, this really does decrease the ability for someone to slip, trip, or fall, which is a huge liability for any organization. So we're taking every step possible to take that, that piece away from the equation and making sure that we're taking care of our people. Um, the, other, the other part of that, too, was the old tile that was there. Uh, this was done not only within on the apparatus floor, but we removed all the old tile that was in the fire station itself because during COVID, we realized that we couldn't clean the floor adequately. There was no way for us to clean it adequately, so it became a lot more liabil liability issue than anything else. So we had to remove all of that and then put this type of flooring here. It's like a pebble tech flooring throughout the remainder of the fire station and in all the kitchen clean areas to make it a more clean environment with the idea that we're gonna do the same thing over the next two to three years at fire station two. All right, facilities and other things as well. Uh, we redid the roof, not on this portion of the building, but on the crew's quarters, it was leaking. We had that done as part of our capital improvement projects. We painted the interior of the fire station bay as well as the interior of the fire station and also the administration side. It hadn't been done in over 12 or 13 years. Uh, we did the landscaping, and I don't say that we did it, but we actually had that donated by Stockbridge Farms. One of our employees was a former employer, actually he's still he's kind of employed with them. He got them to donate all of the um, olive, the tiny little olies and the trees you see on the other sides, as well as the rocks and everything around the base of the flag and the uh, bell. So we have a lot of public-private partnerships that work well for us. Uh, the training room was another one of our capital improvements. Uh, these just came in today, as a matter of fact. These tables and chairs, uh, with all of our training monies and some of the other things, we want to reinvest in what we're doing. So when we do bring people from the outside, they see that we are an organized fire department and we really care about not only their safety, but their well-being and their comfort. So we want to make sure we offer an environment where people can actually learn. All right, staff vehicles. Uh, this is uh, one of three or three newer staff vehicles. This replaced or is replacing the little white pickup truck uh, that says Kingsburg Fire Department on it. This is Utility 143. It's a 2022 F-150 four-wheel drive crew cab. It's a gas motor rather than a diesel motor. Uh, we couldn't get a diesel motor at all. They were on a three-year waiting list for any of those from the commercial part of it. So we opted to go with that. It will be outfitted with a radio package and a smaller command module in the future, as well as a Lear top, so it will look just like this rig here in the future. This was the second vehicle that looks just like this, so many of them will look exactly alike. We don't want to have one-offs or different types of vehicles. They all have the same abilities as well. So we're creating that depth in the process, but also replacing equipment that was in dire need of replacement, dire need. Um, this vehicle essentially will have a lot of ability to tow. We will start doing the um, modularized pieces of fire departments at our level so we can have trailers rather than vehicles for our specialty things that, that are hazards within the community, either specialized rescue or hazardous materials, which we will go into in the next few years. Training. Uh, we put a lot of money in training, as we saw. Uh, how much have we put in? Essentially, these were pictures of the courses that over the last 18 months or a year, both myself and all of the command staff, our captains have gone through so that we can make this next leap for them to change from captains to battalion chiefs. Uh, it's been about 500 hours of training for a group of four people, including myself. So we are taking great strides to bring all of that knowledge back to the, to the citizens and create a much uh, more professional, efficient, and effective fire department. Uh, company officer, uh, we've put on a number of those classes as well as engineer classes. In other words, the person that drives the fire engine or the fire truck. This is an example of one of the classes we have here. We actually host these classes uh, once a year. We'll be hosting another one in January. Yeah, in January. Uh, basically the same thing. We'll, we'll train our own people. We'll be open up to the outside. It gives our people a chance to touch the things we don't often get to touch because we don't have a ton of fires. Knock on wood, which is a good thing, but we also want to be ready for those events. The only way to do that is to train. Uh, how much have we done? 
2,000 hours worth of company officer and engineer training. And again, each one of those hours has a specific dollar amount that you get reimbursed from the college to do that. Uh, rescue training, over 3,000 hours. And this is a picture of the person who got their award tonight. That's Devin Young. There's uh, Jeff Lloyd here getting their confined space rescue. This was a high angle rope rescue class. It was up in the mountains. Here's another one uh, way up in the mountains on a huge boulder in the middle of nowhere, basically pulling people off the side of a ledge. We're bringing all of that training that we're sending our people back here in skills and again to be more efficient and effective. CPR, uh, a lot of folks have been going through CPR classes, uh, 50 trained providers over the last year. We've done a lot of hands only CPR, which you see uh, Devin Young again demonstrating here. 300 hands only and choking classes or folks were actually given this training. And we do that training at every public event that we have. We do our hands only CPR. You've probably seen it at the uh, Crawfish Festival, also at Swedish Festival, the car show. Any chance that we have to put that out in front of someone, we're making our community a heart safe community. And that's the only way we can do that is by increasing the total number of people that know how to do CPR, rescue your fellow man or woman. CERT, it's been a big one. CERT has been a huge portion of this as well as has been Rolinda. Uh, you're seeing these backpacks. So these backpacks were directly attributable to the work that Rolinda had done. Essentially, we are creating a group of folks that are the secondary responders other than the fire department. We bring them, train them how to respond to local emergencies because when we're all on a call and there's nobody left, we need another group of people to come in and help us out with a large scale disaster. Uh, each one of these backpacks was purchased through the Liscos California grant. Uh, we got about $15,000 from that grant. We're also going to be getting a generator. We had some other, uh, what are some other items you got in that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got a tremendous amount of equipment just for CERT. So each one of these ways, as we start expanding, we're trying to find other ways to support that, that uh, piece rather than having it come back onto the department or onto the city to keep it moving forward. All right, so CERT uh, vehicle. This is a picture of the actual vehicle that was outfitted with CERT items. What you see basically in here was, remember the air compressor that we had for $70,000? This is a mini version of that in a mobile vehicle that can go out to sites to fill air bottles. Because one of the constraints that firefighters have, especially when you get to a call, is how much air can we have on, on scene and how often can we change those tanks, especially in a large scale fire that we can't control in a short amount of time. So if we can have this vehicle that's supported by certain members to drive to the scene, we're able to actually put water on the fire more consistently and have it go out quicker. So really it's a multi-pronged approach to get many of our people working together and our systems working together uh, as a cohesive unit. All right, wellness. This is a big portion of what we did and this is one of the things that you had brought up I think in our last portion with our ambulance rate increases. So we had a $140 after 7.45 at night uh, call fee. That specific call fee it was put together so that we could pay for these particular physicals for the folks in the fire department. Each one of those physicals is about $1,000 per person per year. So rather than have that born through the department's uh, budget, we have that born through offset costs that are from night calls. So we've, able to, uh, we've been able to give all of our folks now, as of last week, they went through the first round of their wellness checks. Uh, we did cancer screening, we did plyometric testing, which is how far can we bend, how far can we jump. It essentially gives you a good indicator of your overall body limberness and allows you to decrease injuries over a period of time. So we're really putting a lot of work back into being effective and efficient. It's really what it comes down to. Uh, again, this was funded from that uh, night call piece. Outreach has been a huge portion of what we've been doing. Uh, FICE is Firefighters in School Education. You're seeing one of the FICE demonstrations here at Washington School. We target all of our elementary school folks with a stop, drop, and roll, tools versus toys. Matches and lighters are 
tools rather than toys. Very simplistic things, but we are consistent with that messaging all throughout their elementary school years so that when you get to junior high and high school, that's repeated over time. Same thing with crawl low under smoke, the sounds that alert us uh, for smoke detectors, all those other things are consistent things that we're doing. We've reached over 1,000 kids in Kingsburg in this last year, just in the FICE presentation. Those are organized going out to the schools and having that time to actually teach them these specific fire prevention items. Other items of outreach that have been really, really effective, we partnered with American Red Cross to do some smoke detector work within the community. This was very effective with a lot of our folks really uh, at the grassroots area volunteering to come help us. Uh, the American Red Cross gave us free smoke detectors and helped us with their folks. Uh, they provided the kits that you're seeing here, the little drill, all the other things, all the equipment that was needed, they provided. We just needed to provide the labor. So in that partnership, we were able to actually put in 172 smoke detectors in one day. In one day. Our plan is to do this as they roll out in the next quarter again and target different areas within the community based upon the age of the homes and the age of the folks within the home. That's been the best way that we can uh, attribute fire deaths because fire deaths typically increase with the age of the resident and the age of the home. Other pieces of outreach, uh, Career Day Explorers. This is another event, again, that Devin was a huge part of. You also see uh, one of our uh, female firefighter paramedics who just finished probations here at Ortiz. She was instrumental in helping out with our really good outreach piece this year with our um, open house. This is our Explorer event and our Career Day. Over 3,500 high school uh, students Typically, juniors and seniors come to Chickchancy Park every year as a career tech education day. Our equipment from the Kingsburg Fire Department was front and center there. We were asked to come do a huge display, and we had all of our folks that are actually teaching pieces of that all throughout the day. So we had, again, all those safety messages and all of that input because, again, we will have the difficulty of trying to hire folks within the next five to seven years, and that's our perfect target audience, people that are already interested in these fields. Other pieces of outreach were Open House and Swedish Festival. You can see this is part of what we were doing there with our community risk reduction and our Pink Heels uh, fire truck. We had a tremendous outpouring from the community for the Open House, and we will continue to do that every year, all throughout Fire Prevention Week. Um, car show, trunk or treat was also part of that. This happened just this last weekend. Um, the association actually, along with Sierra Ortiz, the person that I had mentioned earlier, she actually decorated all the pumpkins uh, for a theme, and we had our folks out there giving out uh, candy to the folks out in the park. The trunk or treat was a huge success. I think it was probably better than most people's uh, trick or treaters. So again, huge hats off to all the folks that did that. Uh, between all of these other pieces of outreach, we're estimating there were 5,000 or more folks reached with a public safety message and or a fire prevention or a CPR message. So we're being a lot more effective in getting that outreach out there. The last thing we'll talk about real quick is a, a, one of our major programs is out of county resources or our mutual aid assistance pieces. Uh, we typically send out single unit resources. One person goes out for a fire in a overhead position or we send out a strike team of folks uh, as a group. We send that out with that little green fire engine we have as a type six. And we've had nine deployments over this last year. So been very, very, very effective. That's the end of my presentation. A lot of stuff going on. Try to keep it as brief as possible. But got a lot of things. Going on. <laughs> Are there any questions? Questions from council? Oh, go ahead. So the fire med program is on the, they, we, are, we do track them. It's on the back side of the billing piece. So if a fire med member it has fire med membership, they're alerted to that. It goes to our builder and essentially that person's only paying for their fire med membership. Their copay is the one that they basically write off. We don't do anything with that. They don't get charged a bill. And I guess what I'm asking is, do you know what percentage of your 
total folks? Yes, that chart that you had total was broken down by the percentage of the fire ground. Do you guys track at all how many of those are actual fire users? So we had, yeah, we can get the report if you so direct. Next time, just so I'm sure. Yeah. Because I think it's a great program. Mm -hmm. I would just love to see it over the years. I would love to see it coming up with this report next time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's why I say 2% of them are probably not just completely out of pocket. Right? Yeah, 2%, so yeah. Yep. One minute. Two seconds. Fires, you're two minutes faster oh, yes. than medical call. How's mm -hmm. that? If it's the same people, the same shifts, the same Great question. Alarm system, how is it that you're getting fires to them faster than medical aid? It's an interesting question. So one of the things in our data, and this is one of the reasons we're pushing to change the uh, people that do our data now. Uh, it's one of the things I inherited as the fire chief here. We currently use ESO, which I've been... Uh, Reluctantly trying to change, uh, just from cost, we've been trying to find a much better animal that can do a very similar thing. We think we found it, and it's one that the county is actually going with called Image Trend. The reason for that change is because in that same group of emergency responses by the ambulance, it doesn't differentiate between different priorities of calls. So in our prioritized emergency medical dispatch system, a priority one call is a heart attack, someone who's not as pulseless, non-breathing, gunshot wound, uh, motor vehicle accident with entrapment or fire. Those are the priority one calls. Priority two are a little less than that. Priority three calls are I'm sick, I need the ambulance, but it still comes in as a 911 call by ESO. So those priority three calls, which are a majority of our calls, are lumped into that same data set. So I can't extract them out unless I was going to go through every one of the 2,000 calls and pull out all the priority threes, if that makes sense. So with this new program, so it seems like all of your fires are priority one calls, right? Yes. And so when you see those two, I think I just want people to understand that that's, that's right. why you see that because you can look at that data and say, if I call 911 and say there's a fire, you're going to get here in three minutes. Very if good I call question. 911 and say I'm having a heart attack, you get here in seven minutes. Mm -hmm. You just need to understand that you're still going to get that faster response time for a true medical emergency. Correct. As opposed to something that's going to get spiked up. Correct. So with the new system, will you be able to track that? Absolutely. We've, we've actually worked with this vendor, ESO. We made that part of the first thing that I did here in the first six months. The vendor has stated to us multiple times that they were willing to try to fix it. And each time that we go back to them to say, <clears throat> did you fix it? No. Did you fix it? No. Well, why didn't you fix it? I will tell you verbatim, you're not Los Angeles County. That's their biggest client. That it was horrible. Horrible to hear that. But my dilemma is to change that system, I have to extract all of our data and push it to this new system, and I have to find one that is equally priced and is as effective. So I don't want to leap from the fire pan, from the frying pan into the fire, but it's something we are currently looking at right now. We think we found them, but we still are in negotiations for their price. It's very important to us too. Our people are our number one resource. I have a couple questions. Um, it's just on air compressor. Mm -hmm. So, do you have other communities, you know, that are asking to for you guys to fill their their tanks? Ironically, that you'd <laughs> ask that. Uh, one of the, one of our initiatives is to try to be not only self sufficient, but also to be outward facing, to become a regionalized resource. So what we're looking to do is train the person who oversees that program to be able to maintain all of the self-contained breathing apparatus. In other words, the air tank on the back of a firefighter's back. They have to be certified. They have to be uh, vetted in the system to be able to work on those. Each one of those has to be tested by a technician. If we train the person to be a technician and we have all of the tools, that person can then, we can then charge an individual fire department to do that work. So we're actually looking to expand in those particular areas to be more valuable to the community, but also to be more of a regional value, but also to get what that's worth, to charge people for that particular service. So yes. Okay. And second question is, the trunk or treat, is that the first time that Kinder has done the trunk or treat? 
Uh, to my knowledge, I think it was. It was kind of a last minute idea by, actually came up from the police chaplain. Uh, they flew it through the group there. The uh, police department folks said, this is a great idea. They asked our associations when we want to do it and we jumped on board with them and it was hugely successful. So I think these types of community grassroots based things have been really, really successful for us in the outreach. Yeah, because I had seen that term in a different city. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was driving around and I said, what, what's trunk or treat? You know, earlier last month, and I'm like, and then I saw it here, and I, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, it's something to do with the police department, the fire department, and, mm -hmm. and trick or treating. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's another way for us to make sure we're vetting a lot of, especially with the, uh, as Councilperson Purcell knows, fentanyl is a huge epidemic mm -hmm. in our community. There's a way for us to vet the candies that are given to kids. It's another way for them, for the parents to feel a little more safe about what right. we're doing. We're trying to figure out how we do that in, have the health message of, <laughs> I don't want to give you a ton of candy because I don't want to see you later on with diabetes, but uh, I think it's a good good faith thing that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any public comment on uh, the fire department update? Okay, yes. Good evening, everyone, council, staff, public. I'm David Silva from District 1. I'm a resident here. I had the privilege of meeting with uh, Chief Perkins um, several weeks back. And in that presentation right there, there's a ton of positive. And he talks about expansion and things of that nature. That's why I'm a big proponent of staffing that Bethel fire station. So um, I think there's a lot of positives. And I think that we can build on those positives even further and we were at a three, went to a two. I'd like to see him get to a number one. And I three think points that three points away. we're three points away. Nice. Five years down the road, I'd like to see him be at number one and us at number one. So yeah, sure. I just wanted to say thank you to the, the city council and to the chief and all the staff because it literally is good stuff going in the right direction. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anybody else public comment? No? Okay. Um, any more dis council discussion? No? Okay, that was information only. Thank you, Chief. Next, we have council reports and staff communications. 7.1, Community Service Commission. Community Services meets next Wednesday. Okay. Public safety, uh, we... I believe meet soon, like in a week or so. Yeah, I know. Next week or the week after. 7.3, Chamber of Commerce. We meet next week. Next week. 7.4, Economic Development. Uh, Economic Development Committee meets on Monday afternoon, and they're going to review um, the mini mur mural applications. Seven point five finance committee. We met last Tuesday, I believe it was, and went over a lot of some things like looking at tax advantages for the widening of some of the aqueduct and long term investments. Okay. Seven point six planning commission. Uh, planning commission has not met since our last meeting. Um, tentatively set for next Thursday evening. So next meeting. 7.7, .7, South Kings VSA. Seven point eight. 7.8, <coughs> Downtown Business Improvement District. Okay, so the big, big news. Um, we just had Halloween, so you know what comes next, Christmas. <laughs> uh, we'll skip right over Thanksgiving. They spoke about the holiday kickoff that is happening this Saturday, November 5th. So, um... To kick off the holiday season, there will be a trolley downtown, photo opportunities, and um, we just want people to come out and support our small businesses uh, this weekend and every day. Uh, Thursday night, shopping night, um, recommended stores to stay open until 7 p.m. starting uh, this month on the 10th. So we're really trying to get those businesses to stay open on those days. Um, they discussed Saturday Night Street Eat, serving businesses and starting workshops. We kind of took it up last month as well. Uh, really trying to get in front of businesses, bring them together, and work towards um, different things that we can do in our community. And then um, 
including Murphy. And all of a sudden, they're going to try to implement and get rolling on that system. Any questions? Yeah. 7.9, Council of Governments. Uh, just a brief update. Um, you know, Council Member Roman uh, is ill, but uh, I stood in for her yesterday as we uh, did the uh, groundbreaking for uh, the um, Measure C project, the Golden State Boulevard project, 14 mile project, $53 million project that involves uh, Kingsburg, Selma, and Fowler. Um, so uh, excited to see that project get going. We'll start to see more of that work um, after the first of the year, but yesterday was the official uh, kickoff. Seven ten, council member reports. I have no reports. You have no reports. Seven eleven, city manager's report. No report. Okay. So next eight, future agenda items. Seven eleven. Okay. Adjourn regular Kingsburg City Council meeting for tonight.